Joel, it's truly a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. I can ask very questions with you. You're so you've written 20 plus books, been at the Harvard Business Review, now at one of the prestigious think tanks, Milken Institute. Um, let's start with uh, the renaissance, as you call it, in the energy sector in this country. Right. Uh, your take on that. Well, actually, we talked a little bit about it on the panel today. And uh, we're in the process of seeing a transformation of the U.S partly as a result of uh, the new uh, development of shale oil and, uh, and natural gas. The U.S. economy industrially is the largest in the world. What we're going through now is putting Saudi Arabia on top of it. So you add the two together, natural gas, oil, all the energy resources that we have with the industrial and intellectual base and it, it's going to fuel a, a, a new era of growth. When you talk about uh, the Middle East, uh, just yesterday you were talking about uh, how U.S. itself produces a lot more uh, than Saudi Arabia. We don't focus on that. Uh, right. uh, when you have enough resources here itself in your backyard, uh, there is little rely reliance on the other factors. So where does this equation play in and fit well uh, you know, our dependence on our own resources and trying to depend on uh, foreign resources. Well, what's, what's interesting is almost all of the studies that I've seen forecast that the U.S. will be energy independent and perhaps even an exporter in the 2020s, so uh, a net exporter. So what we're seeing in, is a, a U.S.-centric perspective where there are more uh, fossil fuels in the U.S. than in any other country uh, based on uh, now the addressable reserves that we have. But if you look at North America as a unit, it's even, the picture is even better. We have the largest market in the world. We have an incredible creativity in this region. We have enormous intellectual resources. We have an immigrant community that is starting businesses and very creative, contributing to the economy. And then we have the resources of capital in the U.S., which right now is four and a half trillion dollars undeployed in the private sector, ready to invest. Then add to all that energy, uh, independence, great sources of energy. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, and North America together have a tremendous future and people discount it but think of one thing the US is importing four million barrels of oil less today than in 2008 four million barrels a day is equal to all of the energy that Japan imports per day so we have cut our uh, energy imports by one Japan and we've done that in five years. So when you uh, take a step back and look at the uh, broader perspective of uh, e economic empowerment, the question I'm asking is, uh, it, becomes a, it has become a cliche thing. The contribution of immigrants is, is so enormous here. But you really look deep into it. You know, you have come as a professional, uh, become an executive, and now you're transformed to entrepreneur, and now you're an investor. It's a right. whole cycle. Right. Uh, what is your take on this? Well, first of all, I think it works two ways. First, you, you have immigrants coming to the U.S., uh, Indians predominantly in Silicon Valley, having done very, very well. But you have a lot of people coming here to work in IT firms and so forth, and then they go back home. When they go back home, they're entrepreneurs as well. Now, had they always stayed at home, they probably wouldn't have become entrepreneurs. So there's something in the culture here that uh, Indians have uh, an easy time adopting that they take back home and they use to start businesses. So if you look at the great new breed of entrepreneurs in India, most of them have done a stint in the U.S. So it, it does go both ways. The cultures have an interesting and very symbiotic uh, way of interacting and they mix very well. Is government an enabler or an impediment in 
instances of entrepreneurship. Now, governments like to take credit, and not just U.S. across the world, but without active participation of the entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, where does the government's role start, and where does it, or where should it finish? Well, I would look at it a different way. Okay. Um, in fact, we've done studies. I'm part of a group called the Private Capital Research Institute. So we've looked at that. And what we found is that governments actually can be successful when they start businesses or set up venture capital firms. But typically, when we've compared them, they're, they're not as successful as private uh, sources doing the same thing. So governments are less efficient, but they have a role. And they, and they certainly can do the job. They just can't do it as well. I want to take you uh, a step back and look at the broader world economy. Uh, you have the emerging economies, you have the Middle East where we're trying to bring some kind of you know, new political stability, and you have the Europeans, the, the old bloc, who are trying to come to terms with the rapid changes in technology mm -hmm. and the new economy. Uh, where do you think it is moving slowly eventually in, in the next decade? Where should the countries be focusing their resources and energy? Well, I, I think if you look at that group, you see Europe is having a very, very difficult time, and it's likely to have a difficult time for a long time. The Middle East um, is frankly going to lose its significance in a lot of ways. We probably will have, for the foreseeable future, actually surpluses of energy. So the Middle East as a uh, pivotal region of the world is going to uh, be less than it was in the past. It's still going to be rich. It's still going to have resources, uh, uh, financial resources coming to it, but it's not going to be as critical because it turns out the same kinds of energy bonanza that the U.S. has had, that Canada has had, is available to a lot of countries. So its its role is likely to diminish. But where we have a lot of growth is Asia, of course. Everyone is focusing on Asia. But uh, the most vibrant interactions, I think, are between Asia and the U.S. because we have a lot of symbiotic uh, uh, needs, uh, we needs for capital, but also needs for technology. The flows go both ways. People interact very well between the two regions of the world. So I, I think, uh, first of all, I'm optimistic about the U.S. I think its uh, problems are temporary and its resources are tremendous, but I'm even more optimistic about closer relationships with Asia. There was a great resilience in your generation. Uh, and the generation just before you. They put the blood and sweat to make America what it is. Uh, in spite of what all the naysayers say, this is still the destination that the world looks up to. Yeah. Give it an opportunity, open the gates, and you will see the world will come right. here. Right. Where do you think we slack? So I'll give you two examples. I was just talking to another executive from the car in the, you know, industry. Uh, we, we slacked greatly. Uh, when the you know, Germans were knocking on the doors, the Japanese and now the Koreans are knocking on the doors. We realize the mistake and are trying to correct it. Education is again at fault. Uh, instead of focusing on the STEM, we're trying to focus on you know, the more uh, non cognitive skills. Mm -hmm. So much that we you know, gave, gave the academics away. Now we're coming back realizing that the Koreans are doing better, the Chinese are doing even better, Indians are coming. So, when you look as an American and the opportunity that the world provides for America to maintain its credibility and the number one slot in the world, uh, what are the two, three things you would suggest, broadly speaking? Well, first of all, I, I think you have to take into account that, that this happens every generation. So, so the car industry in the 1920s was built up by immigrants. Uh, you had Henry Ford, who had the great vision, but most of the uh, skilled workers were Europeans. They came from Norway, Germany, Czechoslovakia at the time. They had all these technical skills, they had machining skills, metalworking skills, so they came as a wave and they worked in that industry and built it up. We had the same thing in the 80s and 90s, a lot of Indians, uh, uh, Chinese, Israelis came to Silicon Valley and built it up. So the U.S. has constantly been doing this, and we, every year, uh, every generation, people say, my God, how terrible this current generation is. It's so lazy or they can't do anything. But it's not true. Uh, the U.S. is built and has been built on imported talent 
for, uh, for years. And in some ways you could say the U.S. is the finishing school for all this talent that was developed in other places around the world. Well, the other question I want to ask you is uh, America's core competitiveness in the global market. Uh, just like we try to uh, export uh, the democracy in regions where they're not used to democracy, maybe a different version of the democracy model might work in those regions, not exactly right. the way we perceive it. Right. Look at India, it's so diverse, so multicultural, but when it comes to election, the largest democracy in the world, yeah. without any problems, right. every year elections happen smoothly. Right. Go across the border you know, to other regions from India. It's not the same because the, the perception of democracy and the participation is very different. So I'm asking you this question about entrepreneurship. Now America is trying to export the model of entrepreneurship, but it might be differently perceived because they are, you know, uh, cultural, uh, religious, you know, regional. More importantly, they are patriarchal businesses. Yeah. So yeah. how do you, you know, relate our business uh, model, our startup culture, and then try to tell them that this, there is a way out. Well, it's, you know, elements, uh, Americans become very enthusiastic about exporting everything we do here, and, and a good measure of it doesn't fit anywhere else in the world. It doesn't stop us, we still try. But, but what's interesting is that traditional cultures, uh, whether we're talking about India or even China, uh, they operate in their own way. They have they have their different speeds, and they have what they are good at and what they're not. And entrepreneurship, even now, is really low paternalistic, where you have family uh, businesses or those where the state is very very powerful, like China. So China has not uh, has entrepreneurs. If the government asks someone to be an entrepreneur, then they do very well. India has a very structured uh, economy still with a lot of family businesses so it's mostly entrepreneurship is when uh, someone in the family starts a business and that's that's uh, that's a slower and uh, less dynamic way to create entrepreneurship than what we have in the US but the US is unique in that respect finally where do you think America's core competency will lie in the next decade well I, th I think uh, that's a great question. Uh, it, I think the core competency in the U.S. is in its creativity. So the, the U.S. embraces enthusiastically new ideas. Sometimes they're crazy ideas and they don't work, but the ability to be open to new ideas and to then uh, implement them, to fail, to try again, to fail and then succeed, the, that's the core competency of the U.S. Joel, it's truly a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.